Um, so my name is Shane, uh, and as Nick pointed out, I'm the GM for the European region at uh, IponWeb or IP on Web. We go by uh, a few different names. Uh, quick background to the name. So the IP st stands for intellectual property, um, which references the original reason we were set up as a business, which has nothing to do with digital marketing, bizarrely. So entirely different uh, track, which uh, I'm happy to, to give you the background on after, after my, my talk. Um, so who are we today? Perhaps more interesting. Um, we've been around for 12, 12 plus years. Uh, we, we play in the digital marketing space, but more specifically in uh, programmatic or automated media trading. So we are scientists, we are um, developers in the most part, so there's about 400 of us globally, and well over half of our staff are either developers or data scientists. So uh, we're at the very core of, I guess you could call it, the um, high-frequency media trading uh, revolution. Um, so things like RTB, programmatic trading, uh, building DSP technology, SSP technology, helping publishers and brands and uh, their agencies frequently to develop tools and, um, and find innovative, innovative ways to reach their target customers at scale. Um, we've had some success. Uh, I guess the majority of our success has been predicated on um, what is in essence our pedigree, which is very strong machine learning chops. Uh, so our founder and uh, CEO and, and still current chief scientist, um, Dr. Boris Muzikansky, uh, came from the world of academia to begin with. He was a lecturer at uh, Cambridge University here in the UK for um, nearly 20 years. And his background is in theoretical physics and um, machine learning. So we have done some very interesting things and some people in the media have said some nice things about Boris specifically and about us as a business. <coughs> and uh, we even won an, an award last year about which we're mightily proud. Um, so we we have the advantage of uh, being a pure play technology company, uh, which in essence means we don't really take a position on media. So we, um, we build technology at a fixed cost um, with usually a transactional uh, pricing model or commercial model um, where our customers pay us in, uh, in advance uh, and they understand very clearly what the, what the costs associated with a first party media trading system will be and, and are throughout our, the relationship we have with them. And that enables us to work with pretty much everybody across the ecosystem. So both brands, as I mentioned, and publishers, but also across all, all sorts of uh, formats and, and media types. So um, we sort of consider ourselves one step removed from the very front end of this type of innovation. So we have, if you like, the underlying uh, nuts and bolts that power uh, these systems. So we can adapt uh, what is, in essence, a very universal platform to cater for display media, um, audio, native, video, uh, things like digital out of home, and more recently, TV um, and even OTT. So the uh, topic under discussion today is, I guess, a, a, a topic we we feel pretty strongly about. Um, the, the final thing perhaps to say on, on the introduction to the company is we have made all of the mistakes possible in this, in this new um, era of trading media, buying media, selling media programmatically um, in, a in a high frequency environment. And there are many mistakes to make. Um, so I, c I come from a, I guess, more traditional ad serving world where everything was 100x, 1000x, uh, a billion x times slower than uh, we see today with these very sort of high-powered systems. And our customers have also made um, very big mistakes. So we have seen uh, exactly the risks, but also the opportunities that exist from this, uh, this new way of, of reaching consumers at, at huge scale. Um, sorry. So we, over the years, I believe, in working with brands and advertisers specifically, essentially believe that there are four components, four pillars to what we're calling a brand algorithm for, for success. 
And a quick definition of the term algorithm, it's basically a set of rules um, that you apply in calculations and other problem-solving activities to reach an end goal or destination. The first of, of which is machine learning. So solid uh, machine learning that is done well, applied in a very bespoke way to large amounts of data, and sometimes small amounts of data. I in our case, at the execution layer, which in the case of a brand typically involves buying media, um, we are exposed to very, very large data sets. So our speciality is uh, micro decisioning at huge scale in very short time frames in order to make effective um, choices between showing a user a specific ad. And that, that sounds like a, a simple enough task, but when you consider that there are typically over a million um, consumers or uh, potential viewers of an ad placement at any one given time, if we talk about whole of internet scale, um, that is actually quite a challenging task. And it looks a little bit like this, and I think this is, uh, this is an interesting slide in the context of what's been happening this week. So this is sort of what we're faced with, or our customers are faced with on a, on a um, per second basis, making these types of decisions around which ads to show to consumers. Um, but I will note that we do so, and our customers do so in a regulatory compliant way. Our customers are getting more sophisticated. So with the advent of things like the Google Cloud, um, BigQuery, TensorFlow, um, and just generally the, the sort of uh, cheap availability of, of cloud computing, brands are, are becoming m much more sophisticated in terms of analyzing what happens in their environments where customers are converting um, perhaps through multiple uh, funnel steps within their own environment, and perhaps even before they reach their own environment um, outside of their, their traditional digital marketing channels. Um, however, the, the sort of temporal cycles or the time frames involved uh, with um, that type of analysis tend to be very different from, from the, the, the type of decisioning that, that we offer on behalf of our clients. So in other words, um, customers for example, within, uh, within a website, website environment where there are you know, um, a limited number of things that the customer can do. We have days to weeks. Signals which potentially can, can be understood as being success signals that might lead to a customer converting. These can be analyzed usually uh, in the time frame of hours to days. But at the media buying execution layer, the decisioning is really, really fast. So microseconds to um, sift through the, the sort of ocean of opportunities coming through, and then seconds to actually deliver the creative assets, the ads, and so on. And so with all of this data and these um, interesting challenges around what to measure, what to track, how to, uh, how to analyze this sort of multitude of, of rich data coming from both your customers and uh, coming from non-customers, but people who you would like to be your customers, we have um, what, what, what we think of as a, a sort of constant conflict axis between advertisers, or in this case the client, um, potentially their agency if they're using one, and the technology vendors or third parties um, that, that frequently are used today in high frequency trading. And so, the example here points to an agency, uh, for, say, who is remuner remunerated um, on uh, a cost plus model. So in this case, it's in the interest of an agency potentially to buy more media um, at scale, perhaps at a higher priority than delivering value for their customer. The client wants clicks, conversions, KPIs that they derive themselves from um, the analysis they do within their own CRM environments, and they want to use their own customer data. A, an enterprise DSP, or third-party provider, uh, 
will frequently compromise on scale in order to be more computationally efficient. So this is potentially a risk, not just for the agency, but also for the advertiser. And it's just, it, it's, it's useful to be aware of the sort of conflict dynamic that still exists in the digital um, real-time marketing ecosystem. And driven, driven to deliver against um, the interests that, that uh, you have as a business, what we have are sort of um, proxy signals for success, um, which uh, in many cases conveniently deliver uh, the correct result. But if you actually examine how effective um, many of these, these proxy signals are, um, and how they correlate to delivered business outcomes, you'll find that the, the correlation is not always positive. And so what you have is well-meaning actors um, basically over-optimizing to deliver against these proxy signals instead of setting up their systems and their processes to deliver against delivered, real delivered business outcomes, in other words, sales or perhaps verified sales um, down the funnel. And equally, there is a risk because of this uh, obsession with, with these sort of uh, proxy success signals that you have bad actors or malicious actors on the other side of the ecosystem selling media and uh, uh, placement opportunities who are establishing machine learning loops uh, to, um, to deliver content, to deliver ad placements in a fraudulent fashion uh, in order to meet these, these proxy signals for success. And this is a real problem for industry. Fraud costs us um, upwards of, I think it's the latest figure is 15, 16 billion dollars um, every year. So we believe strongly in, in, the, in the idea of defining your own KPIs as a brand, as an advertiser. And um, the way you can, you can really do that is by integrating at some level, and it can be fairly simplistic or it can be very sophisticated, uh, a KPI which mirrors success, what success means for you as a brand. Um, rather than the sort of traditional um, media uh, sort of uh, tired measurement metrics, um, which are in some senses catch-all metrics designed uh, to, to serve the, the needs of what we call multi-tenant uh, enterprise platforms. And just extending that a little further, um, out outcome-based uh, um, success looks very much like this, where you have um, the standard sort of uh, supply information coming in to, to an engine which is uh, very sophisticated, developed um, on a, what we call a first party or a single tenant basis um, with very bespoke, unique and um, uh, specific inputs which collectively comprise um, a, a, an outcome-based KPI. And in essence, what we're, I guess, advocating at iPhone Web is that we point the machines at these signals rather than at signals which can be gamed, ultimately. So the second pillar in, in, in achieving this, uh, this sort of um, um, brand algorithm nirvana, if you like, is uh, ensuring that you map your customer journey. And this is something that many brands are doing well enough today already, but there is a, there is a, a component of, of this which is essential for uh, sound machine learning practice. We had a customer in um, uh, Eastern Europe who were actually quite a, quite a large spender um, on digital display. Um, they were, they were pan-European advertisers, so they were spending sort of high single-digit millions annually. Not, not insanely big, but, but pretty big. Um, and they, had, they came to us with a, an interesting challenge. They were seeing very, very strong um, post-click uh, attributed analysis based on their media spend and therefore expected you know, their, their top line ultimately to, to sort of correlate to that, to that signal. They weren't seeing um, the increase in sales that that they expected to see based on that, that analysis. And so they came to us and asked us if we could um, run some tests, uh, create a, an environment where they would be able to man ma measure 
incrementality of uh, the digital display channel versus the, uh, the sort of existing attributed um, success that they were seeing from post-click. And so what we did was we basically created two specific machine learning models, um, migrated their spends from uh, a vanilla DSP, which they were using, into what we call the established tactics um, machine learning uh, model. So in other words, mimicked what they were doing with their incumbent vendor. And then created a second uh, model, which essentially was pointing to a, bes a very bespoke KPI. In other words, we sat down with them, we analyzed what the funnel looked like on their website, which was this. Um, and we worked very, very closely with them to establish a, a much uh, sort of truer representation of what success actually meant for them. And ultimately, success uh, for, for our client was an approved application. So uh, sorry, I've, I neglected to mention they're, they're in the consumer finance, um, consumer lending segment. Um, so they had some interesting things happening on their website. So they had a, a, a loan simulation tool where um, you, could, you could play around and, and simulate uh, sort of repayments. And what we discovered was that there were very strong correlations between uh, people who arrived on the website and spent longer with this tool compared with people who you know, very quickly interacted with it, played around for, say, under five seconds. And that this was one of the success signals that we positively correlated with the next step, which was a completed application, which was still not the, the ultimate success signal. So what we, what we did was we had a, a model um, driving conversions to this section of the funnel. Um, and then we had uh, a custom process where we took approved applications. Once they had sort of rooted out all of the fraudulent applications, they sort of lapsed, um, the lapsed uh, cu uh, sort of applications from, from customers and plugged these log files back into our machine learning model um, and ultimately dro drove the media buying process based on this final result. So with this sort of dual approach, what we found was um, that we managed to achieve an 80% decrease in their cost per acquisition um, again against completed applications rather than site visits or um, uh, uh, a applications made. Um, and uh, based on a th an independent third party multi-touch attribution um, tool uh, company that they had partnered with, we um, were measured at seven percent, seven times greater efficiencies when it came to incremental lift compared with other channels. So that was quite interesting because it was insight for a client that um, in many instances, digital display was actually performing uh, much better than, than other channels which, uh, which they had previously thought uh, contrary. So the, the third sort of pillar um, which, which we see as really essential, and this is uh, the sort of, I guess, one of the, the newer aspects of, um, of, uh, of, of programmatic uh, media trading generally, particularly on the demand side, uh, is price discovery. So with high frequency trading systems, the potential for these systems to be, um, uh, to be used in, in, in a fashion that, that sells you short as a buyer are actually, is, ac is actually quite high. So the story here behind um, dynamic price discovery or optimal price discovery is really one of uh, auction dynamics. So um, RTB programmatic media trading is, is based around uh, the, the sort of classic second price auction or has been since its inception around uh, 10, 12 years ago. Um, but what you've hap you have seen happen recently is SSPs have, uh, or supply side platforms, have been forced to shift their auction dynamics to adjust to, to market conditions and to stay competitive. Um, and this, this change um, has been driven by a phenomenon known as header bidding, which um, you may or may not have, have heard of, but it is, uh, it is an extremely important and um, relevant development over the last, say, two, two to four years in terms of how publishers are monetizing their, their content. And 
it's probably an entirely different um, uh, uh, presentation in its own right. But if you haven't heard of header bidding, um, it is relevant for you as a brand because it, effect, it affects how much you pay for your inventory. There's a quick snapshot of how we got here, but I think the, 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 key, uh, the key sort of um, milestone here in this, in this uh, evolution, this, this represents roughly 10 years of, of RTB technology uh, sort of evolution, is, is when header bidding was introduced, when many of the supply side platforms like Rubicon Project and even Google, um, to, to, to some extent, were forced to shift how they actually made inventory available. And what um, supply side or supply path optimization, which is another term for optimal price discovery, um, really affords you as a buyer is firstly, very aggressive fraud detection. Um, so sort of rooting out any bad actors uh, which might be selling you non-human impressions. Okay, so this is a, a kind of a, a first uh, essential component. Real-time bid reduction, which is really just a trial and error um, approach, machine learning based approach to simply lowering your price um, on the fly in, in very, very sort of small um, time increments in order to try and get a better deal. Um, intelligent traffic routing. So header bidding has given rise to essentially massive duplication of uh, consumers or ad impressions being available across multiple platforms. So where there were, say, uh, three or four opportunities to buy the same user, the same impression um, uh, at any given time, say four years ago, now there are easily 15 to 20 opportunities to buy that same impression across a multitude of different platforms because of this phenomenon of header bidding. So deciding which path you take uh, as, as a, a buyer of that user um, is, is really an important decision because the pricing could be set very, very differently depending on where you're buying it from. And then finally, optimal bid discovery. This really is about uh, ensuring that when you're achieving the first three, that you're still delivering against the KPIs that you set um, as, as an advertiser. So ensuring that your pacing is still on track, um, that your targeting is still good, and so on and so forth. So th th these are the sort of the, the sub-components, if you like, of, of any good uh, optimal price discovery engine. On a graph, this is a very simple sort of uh, representation of how it works. It really just tests um, bids. Like any good machine learning engine, it will test. And, and uh, as, as my, my boss has, has been noted as saying in the past, machines are very, very evil because they will do exactly what you say. And what he, mean, what he means by that is that you need to ultimately test every possible scenario within the time frame that you have available before you actually have to submit a decision. So this, in a, in a very simplistic fashion, is, is what OPD is, is doing. Um, the final um, aspect of a brand algorithm, which I believe is, is really essential, um, and this is kind of a byproduct of, again, the, the first three pillars, is transparency and, and trust and, and data protection. Very topical, um, given the headlines that are, that are in the news this week. <coughs> and you know, this, this week is the sort of tail end of the last 12 months, as, as many of you, I'm sure, have, have, um, have been aware. So you know, roughly a year ago, we had the ANA report, um, where a lot of shady practices were exposed. Um, a lot of questions were raised around the value of, uh, of digital display advertising, of digital advertising generally, um, and questions in the main about the money. And so you had many, many very heavy spenders um, run experiments where they pulled, uh, they pulled spend from digital channels and they actually saw the same results despite the reductions. And so we're vindicated in many senses um, for A, sort of raising their hands and B, uh, making the changes. And those, those exercises really just demonstrated that yes, there are malicious actors. There are people who look at high frequency trading environments and who take advantage. Um, 
And you had uh, a collapse in, in the stock price of many publicly held holding groups and a huge wave of distrust uh, sweep across the industry. So how do we fix it for advertisers, for brands? Well, we use technology. And that may sound slightly counterintuitive, but the reality is that the, the very technology or at least the concepts behind the high power technology which got many of the brands into this situation is exactly the same technology they will need to ensure that it doesn't happen in the future. So technology should be viewed very much as auxiliary to transparency and to trust. And transparency should come before trust. So before you as a brand begin to trust your vendor again, begin to trust your, um, your publisher, um, you should be demanding transparency because that is, th that is the bedrock essentially um, upon which this industry can move forward. Once you, you have the transparency, continue to validate before you trust. So ensure that you have processes in place um, which typically are you know, a combination of human and machine where you actually check that um, what you have bought, um, the service that you have contracted a vendor for, is actually doing what they originally said it would do. And then finally, ensure that your data is secure. And we believe strongly that first party technology is in fact the only way. So dedicated hardware, um, ring fenced algorithms, uh, scoped in desktop world to a brand's own domain um, is, is probably the only way to absolutely guarantee 100% data security. And that is it for me. Thank you very much.